our next session, I will give to you the one and only, the Honorable Mark Dybul. I think after this introduction, um, the roller coaster was off. The, <laughs> <laughs> the roller coaster was fantastic. My name is Stephanie Friedhoff. I'm a journalist and the director of content and strategy at the Harvard Global Health Institute. And of course, it's such a tremendous pleasure to be moderating this conversation with um, Mark. I don't think we need a whole introduction as to why you're here, um, your, your role uh, in this program. Um, I do want to mention that, obviously, you got an upgrade after leaving Pepfar. You went from bilateral to multilateral. With lots of money. One disease to three major killers, um, becoming executive director of the Global Fund for five years, you know, back at Georgetown University. Um, and you've been this sort of tremendous humanist in all of this, so I'm excited about exploring the story of, of the early days of Pepfar with you and, and how you made that all happen. Um, before I get started, though, I wanted to ask uh, for a show of hands, how many of you in the room are working on Pepfar? How many of you work on HIV AIDS but not Pepfar related? How many of you work on other issues in global health? Okay, fantastic. Um, so we really have a diverse audience. Um, that's terrific. Um, so I wanted to take us back to that moment. Uh, Tony, of course, has wonderfully laid out the, the, the story and the history, and I, I think it's, a, it's quite a powerful um, reminder of how important it is that we revisit the history to better understand how we got here. Part of the impetus for us to host this event was that we sometimes get really worked up in the politics of things. And uh, particularly, I remember how frustrated we all were around that time that Hapra was born with the war and sort of some of the narratives that you had mentioned. So I think it's an important reminder um, to, to get a little more context on how these achievements are made. You know, politics are always complicated. So um, Tony showed us the image of the motor scooter, right? Sorry? Yeah. Mike's my mic on? Yeah, it's on. Can you not hear me? It might just be too low. Too low? Okay. Sorry about that. My problem here. Is this better? Yeah. How's that? I'm just going to hold on to it. Um, so we saw the motor scooter. We heard the narrative of how. Um, a lot of people in the field didn't believe this could be done. What did you and Tony see that others didn't see? Can you take us back to that? I, well, I think it was, uh, first of all, the mother and child initiative was actually quite important. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to move on PEPFAR as quickly. I mean, everything that exists in PEPFAR, the country operations plans, the interagents, that, that was all done in the mother and child initiative. So, we kind of got a jump start on PEPFAR. I think we would have had a big problem if we went straight to PEPFAR without that experience. Um, and it was brutal. Um, but, the, um, yeah. you know, as Tony said, we, we were doing work with Peter Mugenia in, 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 in Uganda. And as Tony said, we couldn't tell people why. Uh, but when I was there, um, especially for the PMPCT work or for our study, I would go check things out. And Peter was doing satellite clinics um, around, and that's where people could afford antiretroviral therapy. But from Kampala, he started a couple of satellite clinics uh, where nurses ran the clinics and the doctor would come very infrequently. Um, uh, and then uh, TASO, a large uh, Ugandan based organization, by the way, I would say to the last question. Where we are today is because of the countries innovating, not because of any of us. I mean, the delivery and what was done at national scale was only possible because of the people in the country. Really, it was, it was their innovations that allowed all that to happen. Um, but TASO had linked up with CDC and John O'Merman, who was on one of the slides, to deliver antiretrovirals to people's homes by motor scooter. So the reason, the way we got to $15 billion was actually, we couldn't tell them why, but we, we, we said we were doing a research project. So we got the date costing data on what it actually cost them for those satellite clinics to deliver by motor scooter, you know, what the bare bones was to do effective therapy. And then John Stover and Bernard Schwartlander had published an article about reducing infections by 60%. I called John 
um, and said, Tony and I are working on a study. Can you give me the country by country breakdown? Because they didn't publish that. So we could get the reductions by country and we could put it all together. But, you know, I, <laughs> we saw the potential because we saw what was there. But when Tony was down there working on the State of the Union address, he was calling me to you know, check on, make sure that certain things were true. And I, was, I actually had to step out of a meeting uh, on Wisconsin Avenue. And I remember hanging up and think this, this was the day of the State of the Union and thinking, holy crap, now we have to do this. I mean, I, I, and I said, didn't say crap. Um, the, you know, Josh, Tony and I were on another 15th anniversary panel in Washington and Josh Bolton was on the panel and we were asked, you know, what surprised you the most? And my answer was that it worked. And Josh literally turned around and was like, you never told us that. Uh, because we had to tell him. But really, the, we had no, you, there was no way to know whether or not it would work. And I say this now half jokingly, if I knew then what I know now about how the US government works or doesn't work, I'm not sure I would have thought it was possible. Um, uh, so naivete can be very helpful. Uh, but it was really faith in the country. Uh, and the president had that faith in the countries that, that allowed it to happen. So today, today, of course, we're here to dig a little deeper into, you know, what and how, how and, you know, what did you do first? Take us back to the first six months of PEPFAR starting. Um, what did you do first and, and why that? How did you, it, it seems to me like all of a sudden you're a disruptive startup, you know, in this entrenched field. Oh, yeah. Uh, startup is probably the right way to do it. So the, you know, for those of you who don't know how the US government works, which I knew none of this before, uh, thankfully, um, the 15th anniversary was when the authorization was passed. So there's an authorizing part of Congress, and then there's the people who give the money called the appropriators. They're different committees. So the 15th anniversary is actually the day of the, the, that the authorization was announced. Um, <laughs> that was brutal. Um, just getting to the authorization was brutal. Activists, because of language put in uh, by, in the committee on a party vote on abstinence and on, on, sex tra on sex workers, none of which the administration cared about. It wasn't actually from the administration. It came in in Congress. The activists actually told me they, they were going to do everything they could to make it work, fail because they wanted, they, I mean, really, people want, activists were actively trying to prevent PEPFAR from succeeding. <laughs> But literally to let people die because they didn't agree with some of the politics. It was just mind boggling. And the Republicans were like, well, are you kidding me? You just did the Millennium Challenge Corporation. You already gave a big gift to the Global Fund and now you want to do 15, but no way. The Republicans said, There's this, you're not gonna get any of this money. Never gonna happen. It's dead on arrival. The chief clerk in the house actually said, this is dead on arrival. It's not, we're not doing this. Um, so we had to get from authorization to the money, and that was all the president. I mean, he just, he just pushed it through and got, you know, just pushed the votes through to get it done. Um, and that was a very short period of time. It was from May to January of 2004 that we got the first appropriation. So we had the mother and child initiative going on. We, were, we already did the interagency. We already did the operations plans. We had that kind of basis, but we had to start putting the systems in place. So first we worked out of the Office of National AIDS Policy. Once the authorization was passed, we were allowed into the transition offices because Randy Tobias had been nominated, but it wasn't until the appropriation that we could actually start. So we had about eight months to work on things, and then we were able to take off, which is why that the large Harvard grant, one of the first things we did is put money out. Because if we didn't put money out, Congress wanted it to fail, activists wanted it to fail, uh, we, no one liked, it's really remarkable looking back on it, everyone hated PEPFAR. The, really, it was, it was unbelievable, it was, it was brutal, absolutely brutal. The agencies wanted it dead, USAID in particular wanted it dead. So one of the things we had to do is get money out quickly. So appropriation was in March, Those are, we'd written the awards, we brought people back from the country to write the announcements. As soon as the money was appropriated, we put out the announcement, and we did the awards in May, March, I think it was, March or April, and then people were on treatment in May. So from January to May, we go back to Congress and say, look, we're meeting our goals. And what we had to do was, was have that plan, which was mathematic, I still don't know how, that we met every target on time, on budget. 
I have, it was just sheer, I, I have no idea how that happened actually. Um, but we were able to methodically support the countries to achieve those goals and it was a hockey stick. So they're low at the beginning and then it went up, uh, which is exactly what happened, it just keeps going up um, um, because that was how it was planned. But it was, it was very difficult for a cup in the countries because the countries were annoyed. Um, they found out about it the morning of the State of the Union address too. So we, we were saying this is gonna be a nationally scaled up, country owned approach. You're gonna own it, we're gonna support you. But the president announces in the State of the Union address without the countries knowing, we're gonna work in your countries, these are your goals, this is the amount of money you're gonna get. Uh, that didn't go over so well. Uh, and then there was always an issue of is this real? Because a lot of presidential initiatives don't go anywhere. Um, we counted 72 of them at the time PEPFAR was announced. Uh, the president probably didn't know about 68 of them. Um, uh, so the countries weren't really had seen commitments many times before and they were very worried about scaling up. Mm -hmm. It's a bilateral program which is very different which I learned being at the Global Fund and it, so countries always see it as coming from a bilateral perspective and always wonder what else is going on. Uh, so we had to convince the countries we were serious, the money would come, it would continue and in the fourth fifth year, actually, they started to slow down putting people on treatment. Deb was running the CDC program at the time because they thought it was gonna end when President Bush left office. And that's why we had to push so hard on reauthorization, which was at $50 billion rather than 15. Well, 48 because of some bizarre, uh, that's for a different story. But um, um, we, without that reauthorization, they weren't gonna put more people on treatment because they weren't sure there would be any more money after President Bush left office. So. Uh, and Deb's actually the one who have to help us, have helped us recalculate everything to get to those goals. But, you know, the, the, the countries were not comfortable at all. So we had to support them to convince them. And countries were really creative um, in how they did that, the country teams. But, you know, the scale up was intense and, and difficult and brutal. The politics remained brutal for about, actually through reauthorization, um, although it got better because we met goals. Um, but in the countries, the stuff that had to be overcome was breathtaking. I mean, if think about it, who came in first for treatment? People with two T cells, right? Only sick people. So at the beginning when PEPFAR started, those of you who remember, the only people who came in for treatment because of the stigma and discrimination were dying. They were almost dead, they came in on stretchers. So they would come into the clinic, get drugs, and then they would die. So what immediately we got all over the place was the drugs are killing them because they were alive when they went into the clinic and then they got the drugs and they died. So you had to overcome that. The religious issues, the, sti the uh, stigma and discrimination around sexual contact, reaching young people, the, it was really, really tough. Um, and I would say two things when we talk about the legacy of PEPFAR related to this question. One, and it's, it, for those of you who weren't there, it's hard to describe the hopelessness that was in the, the villages. So literally every person in Africa thought they were going to die, uh, with good reason. I mean, 75% of pregnant women in Botswana and some districts were HIV positive. Um, uh, whole villages were run by orphans, right? So everyone thought they were going to die. Um, so if you think you're gonna die, why, the hopelessness was just palpable. Why would you get educated? Why would you? The hopelessness was, was, was killing the continent as much as the virus. Um, and that change in hope, I mean, to go back to the same villages 10 years later and to see them transform, President Bush's transformation, and the and energy and the creativity is rather remarkable. It's that creativity that's going to allow us to fix the future or the, where we're gonna go for the future. And the second thing was the infrastructure. Um, the debate about health systems and, and HIV drives me to distraction, I mean, it just is insane. As Paul Farmer said, what health system were you talking about? You know, what health system was there when the HIV response came? And this is one of the key things, and it's really difficult for people to understand who don't know this, but this is a chronic infection that needs treatment the rest of your life. It's not a vaccine, it's not a two month treatment, it's life. And it's prevention for life, just like diabetes, hypertension, other things. So the systems had to be put in place that were non-existent to get drugs to every village, to get human resources to every village, to get logistics, communication. Those systems and the talented people from Africa now, there's a cadre of healthcare workers 
and health providers and community organizations that would not exist without PEPFAR. So really what happened in the first six months was get money out, show results, stay on target, and manage the just ridiculous interagency brutality. Um, and the way that was finally handled is President Bush called into the op his office, Secretary Powell, Secretary Thompson, Randy Tobias, uh, and Andrew Natsios. So you have two secretaries, the most senior, Secretary of State, Secretary of Health and Human Services, the head of USAID, who's the deputy secretary, and Randy Tobias, who at our level was an assistant secretary. I'm not sure if it's still considered an assistant secretary or not. It switches. Um, and Randy, and, and the president put Randy in the seat of honor with two secretaries sitting on a couch uh, and said, this is my guy. If you don't do what he says on HIV, Andy Card's going to tell me, and you're going to get in trouble. And that was kind of it. USAID stopped after that. So we were able to actually get through those interagency battles. We were able to get through the political battles on the Hill. But it's all at the same time. And then the political and implementation issues in the country. I mean, there, you, you, there's no, this is a long answer, because there's, what was going on in those first six months is almost impossible to comprehend. What tips or advice do you have? These are all the narratives. You, as an individual and as a person, as you're navigating these situations, which are similar, as we've heard, to what other people face as they're trying to move these issues in global health. Well, fortunately, I had Tony as a mentor. So the, I, most of the reason I was able to do this is because I just watched him for, for 10 years. Um, but especially going forward, I and mean, this is something people don't understand, among Republicans, the, the people who support development are social conservatives. Right? They're, fiscal conservatives generally aren't in favor of development. The, the social conservatives are because they believe what President Bush always says, too much is given, much is required. So within the Republican caucus, with the, a few exceptions like Lindsey Graham and Richard Lugar, who died not long ago, is a real hero with all of this. With a few exceptions, it's the social conservatives that back these programs. So you've got to manage the politics of social conservatism, or you will lose Funding, um, it, it disappears. Uh, and we're, when at the beginning, we built a coalition of the faith community, the private sector, and um, um, the international NGOs. We've lost two of those. So we're back down to the international NGOs. And that's not going to sustain the financing, uh, to Tony's point on activism. I mean, and Deb's doing exactly the right thing, trying to turn everything over to local organizations, but then even they disappear because they're not getting the money, so there's no reason for them to go up and advocate. So keeping together a coalition to support this is going to be very, to support just maintaining where we are is very difficult. Yeah, if it weren't for Lindsey Graham, uh, Kay Granger, Hal Rogers, you know, we would be in deep, deep trouble um, in terms of the financing. So building those coalitions and keeping them live uh, is, is if, if you don't do that, whether, same thing for opioids. It, it, was those, it was those coalitions that allowed us to succeed um, because of our political system. So if you want to move something, you have to build those coalitions. And you have to maintain those coalitions. And that is not easy to do. Um, and then you need to have a plan, show the results. Uh, yeah, we were talking about this last night. Most people don't go into the US government, whether it's on the political side, in Congress, or in the, uh, in the executive branch to fight ridiculous bureaucratic battles. You know, that's not why someone goes in. It's what happens. Most people go in because they want to do something big, including the people in the legislative branch. So when you get to do, if you can actually put together something big that will make a difference in the world and show them that it works, that's what they went, that's what they did this that's what they dedicate their lives to. They didn't dedicate their lives to political battles, even though that's what they do day to day. So what we found is, and in the interagency process, is if we reminded people that you were getting a, a billion new dollars a year with a presidential support to reach those goals, people start changing. And so do legislators. Um, Mike Pence supported the reauthorization of PEPFAR with a critical floor speech on the House and said, look, how often do we get to stand here and save millions of lives? This is not a lot of money. We can get, I'm a fiscal conservative, we can get the money from something else. 
we shouldn't be taking it from saving lives. If you can really show people it will make you transform and make a difference, build the coalitions, anything is possible. I mean, we give up way too early. There's far more bipartisan interest if you can put things in the right context. So part of the narrative about PAPFAR is um, that it's been able to change the global health landscape because of the partnership model, right, moving from a more patriarchal model to partnerships, but also because you've moved the focus from we don't have enough money to fund this to let's see if we can get to the outcomes and let's see if we can focus on people and outcomes. Um, this, at the same time, this focus on data has sort of received criticism from the beginning and is criticized to today. Where did that come from? The focus on the data or the need for the data? The focus on both. Okay. And, and how has it, you know, why was it so important? Um, so, you know, we've been very privileged, all of us, to be part of it. Global health didn't exist when PEPFAR started, right? There were no, there was no field of global health. It started about the same time around the Millennium Development Goals, but we didn't have a phrase for it. And if you go back to before PEPFAR, um, the way we defined a development effort, I don't care what it was, health, education, food, how much money are you spending? Which was Tony's point. I mean, the one thing the president said is, don't come back and just ask me for more money. Tell me how you're going to do it and how you're going to measure it so it's accountable. Um, and you can only do that with data. But the US government was not, that never had done it. I mean, it was mind, I mean, it just blew my mind when there was, no one had data on anything on expenditures, on, on collecting what was being done with the nothing. If you don't have those data, how do you advocate for money? I mean, you can't. The way we flipped, everyone loved the Millennium Challenge Corporation and the Global Fund and hated PEPFAR. Within four years, it was the opposite. The MCC was supposed to get, be getting six, seven, ten billion dollars a year. They're still stuck at 800 million because they had, you get a year to implement something new. And if you can't show success, you, that's it. And that's exactly what happened to the Millennium Challenge Corporation uh, because they did a really bad job of implementing from the beginning. So you have to show you can use, at that, it's hard to remember back then. No one thought you could spend that amount of money in a country effectively. And the only way you can show that is with data, reliable data. So all the systems had to be put in place to collect those data, which we started doing the PMTCT initiative, but then moved it over to, the, to, the, to, to PEPFAR. And you know, the, the, that's what the appropriators respond to. They're really smart people. I mean, the staff, on the, the, the staff are some of the most talented people I've ever met on the Hill. Paul Grove, Tim Reeser, you know, the, all the, the house changes a lot more, but they're exceptional people. And they're really smart. And if you give them data and they trust it, they'll let you do whatever you want. I mean, Tim Reeser, used, they, we didn't even have a hearing, for a budget hearing for that amount of money in the Senate because they didn't have time. They were like, you give me all the data I want. Why would I, why would I have a hearing? I don't have time for that. So the data were essential. The data were also essential to shift the narrative from paternalism to partnership. President Kagame from Rwanda, soon after PEPFAR, he forgets, he, he doesn't remember this, but I'll never forget it. He said something I will never forget. Soon after PEPFAR, he said, this is the first time someone's respected us enough to hold us accountable. Um, because before it was, we're just going to give you some money to make ourselves feel better or you know, do these pilot programs that we're going to run out of Washington. But national scale of something is, how, how many people in this room think that there, there was a millennium development goal on antiretroviral treatment at the beginning? There wasn't. And there wasn't because people stood out on the floor of the United Nations and said people in Africa were too uneducated and too poor to do something as complicated as antiretroviral therapy. Horrific racist on the floor of the national of the UN. So there was no MDG on treatment. It was, we, we forget what we don't want to remember. It wasn't until a couple years later when we'd proven you could actually do treatment that an MDG was added. The World Bank held a meeting eight months after PEPFAR started to bring resistance experts together to try to stop PEPFAR and the Global Fund because they said too much resistance was going to be created so we shouldn't treat anyone, we should let them all die because otherwise we're going to create a bunch of resistance. So the only way to fight that insanity is with data. 
right? So, and the only way to advocate for budgets is with data. And the same thing's happening in the countries now. Those data are now being used by the countries to advocate for more resources for universal health coverage, for HIV, those systems. We wouldn't be having a UHC conversation if it weren't for PEPFAR in the global mm -hmm. world. Very true. But it's the data. It's the data. So over time, it's become clear that PEPFAR has also changed things on this side of the ocean, right? And, and in some ways, African nations are performing better than some places in the United States, right? In a way, we could do this in Botswana, but we can't do it in Baltimore. What can the US learn from the response in Africa? So one good thing is the guy who's leading the response domestically is John O'Merman, who now uh, moved from Uganda um, and is running that part for CDC. Bob Redfield, who you know, implemented huge programs at, at uh, University of Maryland, um, knows very well. Mike Sag is on Pacha um, uh, and was willing to take the, the massive hits for agreeing to be on Pacha. He's, Charles was at Ciders. That was a University of Alabama Birmingham program to begin with. Now it's a country-owned program. Mike started something called Zambam because he learned really quickly that what the implementation in Africa reminded him of rural Alabama. So he actually created Zambam, Zambia, Alabama, to bring lessons from PEPFAR in um, Zambia back to Alabama. I think if you go back to why, why has the response succeeded, it was because we trusted communities. The communities actually were remarkable at deciding how to get the treatment in, how did they, all the innovation service delivery was in the community level. If you don't get into communities, and that means engaging with the faith community, that it means engaging with traditional leaders. I mean, the same things Tony talked about for the domestic initiative. You're not going to reach people if you, if, you, if you don't engage at a very community level with human-centered design, this work we're doing at Georgetown, really understand what, what DREAMS does, really understand what the problems are, and let the community come up with a solution rather than impose a solution. And the problem in Africa is young people. You know, it's not, there is still stigma and discrimination, but young people in the United States don't go to health services, right? <laughs> They, young people don't think they need to. No young person in Africa thinks that they're at risk for HIV. And they literally say, I'm not going to that clinic ever, which is why the rates are so much lower of accessing services. The communities will figure that out. I've see, we've all seen communities where they've solved those problems. So if we trust the communities, fund what their insights, support them, we will succeed. If we don't, we're going to fail. But the, those initial findings that what, what, why PEPFAR succeeded is totally relevant to the domestic response. And we won't get, we won't succeed if we take a totally medical model. Uh, PrEP in Africa, young people don't access services. That's who needs to be on PrEP. Not MSM. Yes, they do because the rates are very high. But it's not like the, it's a very different epidemic, and it's very much like the, what we're experiencing in the United States for the people we're missing. Yeah, we're going to hear a little more in our next panel. We talked about this yesterday also. Um, and Deb's, you know, totally yeah. focused on this with PEPFAR, too. Yes. So President Bush has often said that PEPFAR was not about him. It was about the American people. By all accounts, the American people do not know a whole lot about PEPFAR. Does that bother you, and would it be better for you know, the challenges of going ahead Um Pepfa was I don't, I don't know, there's a big debate. I mean, um, he, he still says that. I mean, he, we just had the 10th reunion of the political appointees in the uh, Bush administration, um, which is still breathtaking to me. I was one of them. I'm an openly gay Democrat um, that became an independent because I'm sick of both parties. But um, I've never been a Republican. Um, um, and he had to be asked about Pepfar. Because he, and Tony knows this, whenever we started talking about legacy or, he'd, he'd shut us down immediately. He was like, this is not about me. If you, if you make it about me, it's never going to last beyond my tenure, first of all. And secondly, it's not me. It's actually the people in the country. That's who we should be talking about. And it's the American people supporting them in this partnership. And he firmly believes that. In fact, one of the reasons PEPFAR exists is his visceral reaction visceral reaction to the notion that Africans could do something. I mean, it, it upsets him beyond comprehension um, that people would just say that about a whole population simply because of their economic position. It drove him 
absolutely the distraction. Um, uh, and I would say something, if I could diverge for a second, which I keep doing, but President Bush taught me so many things. One of the biggest was how flawed public caricatures are. So he knows this. Um, I did not think much of him <laughs> uh, when he was elected. Uh, I was pretty angry. He was our president, actually. Uh, I gave money to his opponents. Uh, they, he still appointed me. Um, but then I met him. And he's one of the most compassionate. He's one of the smartest people I actually know. Um, he, he, I never had to brief him. Tony barely had to brief him. He comes in asking questions. He knows what he's doing. He reads. He's really smart. The public caricature is completely different. It really taught me about, and then I've been privileged, like many others in this room, to meet people whose public caricature is someone who's so altruistic and just compassionate and cares who are the most self-centered SOBs on the planet. Um, so, you know, these public caricatures are pretty flawed. Um, but, you know, I don't know that it matters in our system how many people know about PEPAR. I think it'd be great if they did, and, and we need efforts less about PEPAR per se, more about what can work and how things can actually work, how you can achieve big, bold things, even in very <laughs> difficult political circumstances, which, you know, around the Iraq war is a pretty tough time, politically. And the Democrat, but we, you know, we always engaged the Democrats when they were a minority. No one else did that. So when they got in power, duh, they're gonna come back to power at some point. They loved us because we were the only ones to talk with them. So the way our system works, you don't need everyone to know because it's not gonna have an impact. Mm -hmm. You need people related to the committees that are key and the people on those committees to know so that they have the political influence. So I'm much less concerned about broad, everyone knowing about PEPFAR and more who's on what committee today, how do we get to their constituents so that their constituents talk to them, who influences them, that's what you need to do. The public knowing about PEPFAR broadly, you know, I don't know, that, and how would you do that? Um, even if there's a movie about PEPFAR, I mean, I, I, it might not lead to anything. So I, I don't know um, that you need that. It would be great if people knew that you can do big things, that we are supportive, and how much people in Africa love the United States because of PEPFAR. I mean, the, the, the Pew does, and Gallup uh, does polls of favorability of the United States. After PEPFAR, um, the favorability rating of the United States in African countries went through the roof. In fact, some African countries like America more than Americans. Um, <laughs> because they saw the American people caring about them. I mean, I, um, I, so in very rural Ethiopia, um, uh, I mean, the, the, the axiom, it, it looks like 500 years ago in the morning, in the mist. I mean, people are going to market with their donkeys. So we went up there, we went to the clinic, uh, a clinic. And, you know, in a village like that, the head of the clinic is also the head of half of the things in the, in the village. Um, and we made them come in and, um, uh, on a Saturday, and which we did all the time, which was not fair. But so I, yeah, I was in a really bad mood because I hadn't been sleeping, and he kept talking about PEPFAR this and PEPFAR that, and I was like, "What does PEPFAR mean?" You know, because I was a snotty little brat thinking he would. Be, can he say President's Emergency Plan for Age Relief? He said PEPFAR means the American people care about us. So <clears throat> that is what matters, right? It'd be great if Americans knew that that's what that change that happened. Um, but I don't know how to do that. If you're, you're a reporter, you're a journalist. You <laughs> well, this is obviously a sobering thing for me to hear because I do believe that the public needs to know and that especially in the, the current time is showing us that it's important for people to understand why science matters and, well, actually, and why these science, programs matter. Well, actually, science, you know, internationalism, I, mean, <laughs> I do agree with you that, and that's why people, I think, circled so much back to PEPFAR because it is a shining example of what can happen when we engage other countries in a different way, when we don't call them asshole, you know, um, when we actually engage people in, in a different way people and in looking. a bipartisan way, it does show what that vision can be. And, you know, one of the things President Bush kept talking about during the 10th anniversary was the vision, and it's not just the United States, it's happening all over the world, all over Europe, all over post-house. And 
we need to understand that, and I think PEPFAR is a good example of, of, of what can happen when you change, but th this is not happening in a vacuum, right? So if you think about it, for 300 years, the socioeconomic order of the world was stable, with the exception of the United States after the world wars. Uh, the, the flow of ideas was pretty controlled. The flow of people was pretty, con I mean, everyone could worried about the flow of people and, and migrants and refugees. We've never been worried about that before, right? I mean, people moved all the time. What people get really worried about is movement of ideas. Think about the printing press. Think about, you know, look what happens, what's happening in China and Hong mm -hmm. Kong right now. Mm -hmm. So when you have massive change in socioeconomic power structures, mm -hmm. like we've never seen, literally never seen before, you have movement of ideas uh, and, and people and and contact that we've never had before. People get scared, right? That's very different. In general, that kind of massive change doesn't happen very often, and we're going through that kind of massive change right now. And so it's not surprising that people re are retrenching, and you know, if you read a lot of history, this happens over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And you have two pathways when this happens. You can look backward, inward, and with fear and constant companion hate, or you can look outward, hopefully, to the future, optimistically. And when we've done that, and PEPFAR is a great example of that, you can change the world. If you go the opposite direction, you know, especially these days, we could destroy the world pretty quickly. And so we're at that branch point. So I do agree with you that as a symbol of what can happen, and this is what President Bush talks about, when you, when you look outward, forward, to the future with optimism, uh, rather than backward with fear, then you can do very different things. But it's not just PEPFAR. I mean, we had, we're going to have to come up with a much better narrative than that. But you know, this all fits into something much bigger, which I'm not sure we're paying attention to, the bigger movements um, uh, and the opportunities or the risks. Well, I, of course, have a lot more questions. I'll ask one more, but I wanted to alert you that we'll take questions from the audience. So if you wanted to come forward to the microphone. Um, I'm not sure which one to choose. Uh, let's move over to your time at the Global Fund. Um, you inherited, you kind of repeated the success in that you inherited uh, the fund at a time when it was in crisis. There also weren't a lot of systems in place when you came. Um, you had a tremendous five-year run. What did you learn from PAPFRA that helped you at the fund and what did you learn beyond that? Actually, PEPFAR was far more difficult than the fund, um, which no one believes, but it's complete, much, much more complicated than, than the global fund. Um, um, and going back to Tony's point um, and the decision on the global fund versus PEPFAR, we had a very active conversation about that. Gary Edson actually wanted all to go to the global fund. I can tell you today, and activists know, that had we put all the money in the global fund, it would have collapsed. They had, there's no way they could have managed that amount of money. And they had no systems to do it. We had CDC, USAID, and country. We had grant management systems. We had all that stuff in place. We didn't have all the other stuff that we had to put in place, but we had an infrastructure. I mean, there were hundreds of people already in countries uh, from CDC, USAID, Department of Defense. So we had an infrastructure. The Global Fund had nothing. If we put all that money into the fund, it absolutely would have collapsed. It wouldn't have achieved results, and nothing would have changed. And really, PEPFAR, without PEPFAR, the Global Fund could not have succeeded. Um, we the Global Fund really built, and the amount of money was tiny in those days. Mm -hmm. I mean, we got it up to 4.3 billion, but that's still less than the bilateral program of PEPFAR. And that's for three diseases. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I do think, that, and they had no systems. I mean, I, I, it's mind numbing to me, 10 years in, that they had no systems at all. No, I asked how much money we were spending on male circumcision. I go, oh, that'll take three months. Go, what do you need three months? Just go into the computer and find out how much I'm like, no, we have to go through the paper. It reminded me of USAID at the beginning of PEPFAR. You know, we have to go through the paper grants. Like, how can you not have a grant system where you know how much money is going for different things? Because there were no codes. There was a, we didn't have a human resource system. We were managing a $3 billion budget at the time on an Excel sheet. It was being run like a little NGO. And that was 10 years in. So, you know, building those systems was, uh, we'd done it before. And in a much more complicated environment across agencies, you know, massive blood on the floor, interagency fights. The Global Fund's 800 people in one building in Switzerland. Uh, this is actually pretty easy. 
what I did learn, and this is something that bothered me a lot when I was at Pep Bar, because we would go to um, uh, events when I was at Pep Bar, and the Global Fund representative would be there, and the head of state was just talking about the Global Fund in Africa. I'm like, what are you doing? We're giving you 10 times as much money. We have all these people. Why are you talking about the Global Fund not mentioning Pep Bar? The reason was they saw the Global Fund as theirs, mm -hmm. and they saw the Pep Bar as someone else's. Um, um, and that, and the difference between multilateral and bilateral mm -hmm. is fundamentally different. And I really didn't understand that uh, difference until I went to the Global mm -hmm. Fund. That the multilaterals, you can get away with conversations as a multilateral. You know, we, we could, with data and other ways, bring up with heads of state, with Michelle CDB at UNAIDS, very sensitive issues on, on uh, sexual norms and um, on who is at risk and why and what they, that we, I, at PEPFAR was really difficult because immediately they'd come back and say, well, you have the same problem. And you, you know, so it was very difficult. But in a multilateral way, you can actually do things very differently. And so the, the interplay, and Deb spent an enormous amount of time, there was a lot of credit for bringing the fund and PEPFAR together in a very conjoint way because it was, it was nasty at the beginning. Um, <laughs> Uh, they would go after, try to take the money away from PEPBAR and um, fight on Congress, and it was, it, was, it was really bad. It was just acrimonious. Now, in country, it's the same. Um, and I was like, Josh Bolton, <laughs> twice. I, there's no way anyone knows, I had no idea. At the end of the budget cycle, there's something called a director's reserve, because when all the budgets of these massive agencies are done, there's like four to five hundred million dollars left that basically gets pulled back by OMB or people overestimate it. And that's called the director's reserve. And the director of OMB with the president decides how that $500 million is spent. Two times, once at OMB and once as chief of staff, Josh gave the entire thing with the president's approval to Pep Um That's just breathtaking. Um, because of this fight with the global fund, because money was being taken from the, uh, so now it's a bunch of different positions. But, the, the, co the combination of multilateral and bilateral, I, I really didn't understand how important that was. Mm -hmm. uh, but we weren't anti-global fund. I mean, the reason Swaziland, now Iswatini, wasn't in Malawi, uh, or were not, was not a focus country is because it had the largest global fund grant. Mm -hmm. So why would we go and replicate what the global fund was doing? So we're like, you do that. We even tried in my last year at, at PEPFAR to transi start transitioning our grants to the global fund to build the global fund up because we could see we, the United States couldn't pay for all this forever. We needed the whole world so that we would transition those programs for reasons which are somewhat amazing. The head of the global fund refused to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so the play between multilateral and bilateral is a very, it's a very interesting and important thing. And getting back to your earlier question, our retrenchment from multilateral towards just bilateral, which is not just happening in this country. It's happening all over Europe, including the, so, the most liberal democracies. They're all pulling back. They're, they're all trying to set up bilateral programs. There's a real pullback. And you know, how we maintain that balance, um, I think, is really important. Mm -hmm. Do you have questions? Please come to the microphone. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming here. My name is Shubha Raghavan. I'm one of the global lead women fellows here at Harvard. Um, Mark, you worked with both PEPFAR and the Global Fund. You know both the strengths and weaknesses of both PEPFAR and Global Fund. Um, if you can elaborate on the strengths as we have to move forward, the strengths of PEPFAR, strengths of Global Fund, and are there any cross-learning each of these agencies or, or um, systems can use to improve their performance better. Um, I understand the healthy competition is very good, but uh, I just wanted to see what is the cross-learning and what are the unique strengths of PEPFAR and unique strengths of Global Fund. So uh, the unique strengths of PEPFAR are, uh, are a, a massive infrastructure. I mean, Deb would know the numbers now, but it's thousands of people in in countries because of the infrastructure of the US government. And the US government is quite good at granting and um, um, systems data uh, that you, know, you really have to drive multilaterals to do. 
And so, uh, but for the long run, uh, the, the advantages of multilateral are huge. And I mean, we need to be realistic here. A lot's changing socioeconomically, as I mentioned. I mean, the World Bank projects that by 2030 20 or so, there'll only be a handful of countries in low income status, which is radically different from where PEPFAR started, Global Fund started. Mm -hmm. As countries move up socioeconomically, PEPFAR is different, it's health. The money for all this stuff comes from development people in other countries. Mm -hmm. From a development perspective, when you climb the socioeconomic ladder, you're no longer eligible for external resources, which makes sense. You're supposed to be paying for it yourself, just like we did in the United States, right? So how we do that transition is going, and this is strengths and weaknesses, both institutions, but I think the fund has the ability to transition mm -hmm. um, because of the relationship of a multilateral, but the two have to do it together. Um, and so it's less strength, weakness, or strength, strength. It's more how in each country as they move towards uh, actually having to not only own the delivery, but own the dollars um, is going to be quite complicated. And that's the big challenge. I mean, really, if you look forward, when we are at that point, when there are only a handful of countries in low income status, and virtually all of them will be uh, in challenging operating environments. So uh, where there's civil war or some, some reason they're still in that. The size of programming we have today is going to be in a very few number of countries in 20 years. Absolutely, the trajectory in each country is different. So I think the real question is how do we support countries for that transition and how do the bilaterals and multilaterals work together to make that happen with the countries? Uh, because we're at huge risk of everything collapsing. And this has happened so many times in development. I mean, if you look at programs in Latin America and, and other places that when the, pro, when the external funding stops, it, so does the programming. Now that's not gonna be the case here, but really that transition and managing that transition, how we use multilaterals and bilaterals comp in a complementary way to support countries on that, that is the challenge of today. And to be honest, I think we need the next generation to help figure this out. Uh, uh, because we're kind of stuck in our you know, mindsets and our ways. And it's the next generation that will figure out how to do that. Um, but most importantly, the, ne the Africans. Um, how will they make this transition? Um, and you've got some heads of state that are really focused on this. We're actually supporting them. From Georgetown, President Kagame is leading an effort to increase domestic finance for health. The shift to universal health coverage is going to, you know, re really make this more complicated, and I think multilaterals have easier w uh, opportunity with that. But really, that's a challenge for all of us to, to figure out. The second question is: In the last four, four or five years, TB has gained a lot of political uh, momentum, and. Um, and sometimes you have to make very difficult decisions at the Global Fund in allocation of the budgets. Quite often you may have to cut HIVS programs and increase allocations for TB that has happened in India. So how do you manage that? How does the allocation, if you can, uh, in a simple terms, because I many students are here, how does the allocation happen for HIV, TB, malaria, and how do you, as a head of Global Fund, how did you manage these tensions of our accusations that we're cutting money for HIV and giving for TB? And how do you manage this? And how do you make these decisions? So there, there are two levels of that. One's the overall allocation. So um, you know, the Global Fund replenishment is this week, actually. Deb, when are you leaving? <laughs> uh, 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 so they'll, they'll get a total amount, and then the board decides the allocation. But you know, for all the fighting, the overall allocations just stay the same every cycle. So there'll be, there's a fight again, but you know, it's gonna stay the same. And, um, uh, but then within country, um, there's agility around, because it's a more of a country-driven process. They have the ability to shift resources within the country. And in India, you know, HIV is actually pretty well managed and the government's paying for most of that. There are some exceptions, especially around uh, sex workers and, and high-risk key populations. But in general, they're actually doing pretty well on the HIV front. TB is a massive problem. And so the Global Fund doesn't have a lot of money in India, but it's shifting more towards TB. And 
you know, Prime Minister Modi is trying to do something on TV. But from a global perspective, and no one wants to hear this, you know, and I always get in trouble for it, but two thirds of the TB in the world is in upper middle income countries. Mm -hmm. It's in India, China, um, uh, principally. I mean, they account for like half of the TB in the world, and Russia. Um, no one's going to be putting hundreds of millions, billions of dollars a year into those countries for obvious reasons. As Tony mentioned, <laughs> we actually dangled Russia, India, and China. That was the first thing to go out of the plan, um, and pretty quickly. The rest of it, actually, I went back and read the first document we submitted um, for that meeting in Margaret's office. Pretty much everything else was there. It's kind of remarkable, uh, except for Russia and China. <laughs> went out really quickly. Um, but if that's where most of the TB is, they have to pay for it, right? I mean, no one's going to put money in Russia. Uh, they actually spend $3 billion a year on TB. They just have really terrible policies. That's where multilaterals can work in some ways better, more, better than bilaterals to change the policies the, the laws, the structures, and that's what we need to spend more time on because countries are spending more money, but they're not necessarily spending it in the best possible way, and that's a big problem in TB. So the allocation is a political decision in many ways, um, but it's also about socioeconomic status and where, where the problem is the biggest. And, and really, with two-thirds of the TB in the world and middle and upper middle income countries, there's not going to be a lot of external resources. So then it's more how do you work to support the best use of the funds that are available. So we're going to take one more question and then. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm a cardiologist and health economist here. And, and the question I have is that if we switch the focus, if we use President Bush's original morality argument and switch the focus from disease to people, then two things come to mind. One is that even within these middle-income countries, there are people who are completely disadvantaged, and so perhaps our work won't be done despite economic progress. And the second is among people living with HIV, maybe the needs will change, so we need to start focusing on cardiovascular disease. Do you, th this is kind of gazing into a crystal ball, do you see that happening, or do you think that we, the only way to continue in the success of PEPFAR is to keep the laser focus on HIV? Um, it's already shifted, and Deb will talk about this. I mean, she's actually, and we started some of this with cervical cancer and um, because of the relationship with HIV when at CIDRs way back. Um, and we started actually trying to link with education, reproductive health. Deb will talk more about this. We did this at the Global Fund. Cardiovascular disease, it's part of universal health coverage. But that's not going to lead to more resources from governments and the re because of the socioeconomic status because just think, it, think about it this way, which I try to remind people, and, no one, and people don't want to hear this either. Imagine being a member of parliament for Liverpool or a member of Congress for Iowa, in a small place in Iowa, and you have to tell them why their Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid are staying stable, and we can't pay for their health care, but we're going to send more money to other countries so that they can provide cardiovascular support. That, that's just not possible unless they're really poor. And then you can make that argument. But it's, it's not, the, the difficulty is we all have limited resources. And so how do we make the best use of the resources in different partnership models? And, and, and how do we do this in a different creative next generation way? Because the model we've been living with for the, next, for the last 15 years is going to cease to exist in 15 years. What are we going to replace it with? And that's where we need a lot of thinking because the opportunities for partnerships are huge. The countries, I shouldn't say this here, we need to stop training epidemiologists in global health programs. They don't need any more epidemiologists. They don't need any more health experts. They know more than we do. I mean, you should hear ministers after we send in technical support. They're like, don't ever send those people again. <laughs> we spent two months educating them and we gave them more than they gave us and we wasted all our time and I, don't ever send those people to us again. You know, we keep, we're focused on this old model that is, is dead. What they need is support and what they want is support on academic to academic, idea to idea, uh, so that you can work together as people, not we have the ideas we're taking to you, but how do we work together? Logistics, management, financial management. That's the type, data, data systems. So how do we start transitioning into that? With, and that's the right relationship for countries as they grow economically. Think about Brazil or Mexico and where they were 15 years ago.
They hate development programs. They won't give to any of them because they were treated like children. They hate them. Um, they weren't, they've never even been to the Global Fund. For, they, you should hear the Brazilians. I mean, uh, they just go off on it. You know, that model is dead uh, functionally. So how do we transition to, to actually have the partnership that we're supposed to have on a different level? And resources are an issue, but it's not the principal issue. And really, if we don't start thinking about that quickly and acting differently, we are going to have countries go off a cliff. And we're already starting to see this in Eastern Europe and other places. So now is the time to be thinking, and an institution like this has that capacity, what does that look like? What, is the, what are the new models? And it's younger people who are going to figure that out. So we need the younger people to start thinking now, what does that look like? Barbara Bush's Global Health Corps is a brilliant example of what that looks like. Uh, she's actually across the street at the Kennedy School now. Um, that's the type of thinking we need, a totally different model. Um, and institutions like this, institutions like Rogers, have the capacity to now start thinking about that. But it, the answer is not going to be, we're going to get a pet bar for cardiovascular disease. Not going to happen. So what does it look like? How do we build the world in an optimistic, forward-looking way uh, with hope rather than fear? We're, and the thing is, we know from PEPFAR we can do it. We know because 15 years ago, everyone said it was impossible. Literally, everyone in the, the vast majority of people at this institution said PEPFAR was impossible. The public health experts in the world said PEPFAR was impossible. Uh, most people in our agencies thought PEPFAR was impossible. It worked. It's possible. So things we think look impossible today, if we think they're impossible, they will be impossible. If we think differently, creatively, learn from the past, but not repeat the past, think a different way, we can solve almost any problem if we all work together. If we don't, we're dead. So a new plan for action and the optimism that you've, I think, instilled in an entire generation are a great uh, place to um, stop for us. And really, who needs Bono when you have Tony and Mark? <laughs>